All right, now while all of these are essential for having a home studio, I'm saving the most crucial part of having a great sounding home studio for last, so make sure to stay until the end of the video. All right, so to start things off, you're gonna need a computer. That way you can record and edit your audio with ease. So, what computer do you need? Mac or PC? Yes. But seriously, I always tell my students, what are you most comfortable with? Did you grow up using Macs? Then go with a Mac. Same for PC. I will say, however, Macs tend to be more voiceover friendly. PCs have multiple audio drivers, which make things a bit more complicated for people that aren't computer savvy. All right, and now desktop or laptop? Totally up to you and your situation. Do you move locations a lot or do you travel often? Then I'd probably suggest a laptop. If you're staying put for a while, I'd probably go with the desktop. All right, so what should your computer specs be? Well, for voice actors, most baseline computers will likely have what you need. However, I will say you'll likely want to make sure that you have at least 16 gigabytes of RAM or memory in your computer. Now, you could probably get away with just 8 gigabytes of RAM or memory, but to be on the safe side these days, I would definitely go with 16 if you can. Now, as far as storage goes, you definitely want to make sure that you have enough, but Honestly, when buying a computer, this is where you can actually cut costs. You can do this because external storage is actually really affordable these days and you can get a lot of it. Link to my recommendations in the description of this video. And you could also just use cloud storage or Google Drive or Dropbox, etc. All right, so in order to edit or record your audio from your computer, you'll need a DAW. Well, what the heck is a DAW? It's just recording software, and it stands for Digital Audio Workstation. Now, I'll be making a video all about the different DAWs in a future video, but for now, all you need to know is no one DAW sounds better than another. The main difference between DAWs is what they're made for. For example, DAWs like Pro Tools, Cubase, Logic, they were made for music production, sound design, large multi-track sessions, and while you can most definitely use them for voiceover recording, it's overkill. And way too overwhelming for people just getting into voiceover, while DAWs like Adobe Audition, Audacity, and Twisted Wave were made with voice actors in mind and have a much easier learning curve. Quick tip. Twisted Wave used to only be offered for Apple users, but now it's offered for Windows users as well. I actually teach classes on all three of those if you're interested. You can find the links in the description of this video. And my DAW classes actually cover home studio setup as well as covering DAWs, and I personally help you treat and build out your home studio throughout the weeks in class. Most people don't know that. Okay, now, if you follow my channel, you already know that I did a full video all about this, but in the future, I'll be doing another video showcasing the top microphones I recommend for voiceover. But all you need to know here is I'm just rehashing things from my other video, but you'll either want to use a large diaphragm condenser microphone, like a Rode NT1, a TLM-103, or a shotgun microphone like a Sennheiser 416, for example. Don't use a dynamic microphone like the Shure SM7B. They don't play well with voiceover. And I know, you're probably like, but... But James, you're speaking into the Shure SM7B right now. Isn't that voiceover? But it's not. It's not actually voiceover. This isn't considered voiceover, what I'm doing right now, believe it or not. If you'd like to find out why that is the case, you can go watch the full video I did all about arguably the most famous dynamic microphone, the Shure SM7B. I'll link the video in the description below. Lastly, you don't need to spend a ton of money on a microphone. This is a common misconception, and one of my goals is to supply you with the truth and save you some money. The Rode NT1 is all you'd ever need for voiceover, and it's only $270. And I'm sure you're asking yourself, okay, then why does the industry use mics like the 416 or the U87 if all we need is a $270 microphone? Well, when would you need to buy those microphones? Honestly, the only reason you'd buy one of those microphones for your voiceover career is because of the name many of those mics carry. That's it. Seriously. Do they sound awesome? Sure, on some people, but it's just the name that you're truly paying for. When agents or clients see or hear that you're using a Sennheiser 416 or a Neumann U87, they get a little excited because they're expensive, legendary microphones, but if you never told them what microphone you're using, would they be able to tell? Absolutely not. I always tell this story in my class because it's so eye-opening and it's a true story, but a talent booked a job and sent the recording over to the engineer. The engineer was really impressed with the audio and asked the voice actor if he was using a Neumann U87, which is a $3,000 microphone. The talent responded with, no, I'm just using a Rode NT1. And the reason that engineer thought it was a $3,000 microphone is because that voiceover talent had acoustically treated their space very well. And that is where you want to spend your money, on how you acoustically treat the space that you're recording in, not on an insanely expensive microphone or interface. Speaking of interfaces, just like I said, 
Just like with microphones, you don't need to spend a ton of money here, but if you're going with an XLR microphone, you'll need an audio interface. If you're asking yourself, what the heck is an XLR microphone? Make sure to watch the video I did titled, Best Microphone for VoiceOver, link in the description of this video. Okay, well, what is an interface? Some people insist on calling it a preamp, but every interface has a preamp in it, so it's really not a preamp, it's an audio interface. But I did a video titled Top 7 Interfaces here on my channel. If you want to find out what I recommend, or you could just check out my recommended equipment, link in the description of this video. But honestly, just get something affordable like the Focusrite Scarlett Solo 3rd Gen. Some people are skeptical about Focusrite because their previous models had issues, but they've fixed all of those issues with their 3rd generation interfaces. I had someone comment on my Top 7 Audio Interfaces video, all been out of shape because I included the Focusrite 3rd gen interface because they've been having issues with theirs. But here's the thing. I've taught hundreds of students and 90% of them have the Focusrite Solo 2i2 or 3rd gen interface, and not a single one of them have had issues with them. And look, here's the thing. You can get a bad piece of equipment anytime, no matter the brand. My main interface is the Apollo Twin, and I've personally experienced two faulty Apollo Twins in my audio career. Now, does that mean I should stop recommending them? No. Mine has been problem-free for four years now, and I know people that have the Twin and have had no problems for way longer than me. Bad gear happens. All right, now cables. And yes, your cables do matter. 80% of my students, when they start training with me, have cheap cables that either came with their microphone or just cheap off of Amazon or something like that. In most cases, we end up having to replace that cable with what I recommend, Mogami Gold, because the cheap cable emits too much hiss or white noise. Now, I know. I know, Megami Gold cables aren't cheap, but I've had my Megami Gold cable for over 15 years now, and I've never had any issues. Buy once, cry once. Cheaper cables will likely go out on you, and you'll continually have to replace them, not to mention the noise they emit. Megami Gold cables are quad shielded, meaning it will stop any type of interference from getting into your audio. For example, I have no idea why you would do this, but if you laid your phone over a cheap cable, you'd hear frequency interference in your audio. Whereas if you laid your phone over a Mogami Gold cable, you'd likely hear nothing. They're definitely worth their weight in gold. Get it? Gold. Because they're Mogami Gold. Oh, gold! All right, and next up, you would need a microphone arm. Now, right up front, I'm not a fan of microphone stands because they're just more easily bumped, they just kind of get in the way, and microphone arms are relatively out of the way, and you can adjust your microphone position much easier. I personally use the Rode PSA1 Plus arm, and personally, I love it. Honestly, I wouldn't go cheap here because you'll likely run into a couple of issues. Normally, cheaper arms can't hold a lot of weight, and the knobs on the side of the arms won't tighten enough, or you'll end up breaking the knobs because, in a lot of cases, they're plastic. I also have the Blue Compass arm, and it just wasn't worth the money, in my opinion. It costs the exact same as the Rode PSA 1 arm, but has a lot of issues. It's almost useless for me personally. All right, and a pop shield. Now, the best pop shield that I recommend is the one that you can't see. Okay, here's a two-in-one for you. Headphones and monitors, or speakers. Let's start with headphones. When it comes to headphones, voice actors don't need to come at it from an audio engineer's perspective because you're not going to be looking for what an audio engineer is looking for because 99% of the time, you're not going to be mixing the final spot together. You'll just be sending off your raw audio to an engineer that the client has hired on their end to do all of that. Mainly for a voice actor, the most important thing that you're looking for when it comes to headphones is comfort. You'll likely be wearing them for long periods of time, so you don't want your headphones to be uncomfortable. Now, with that in mind, I definitely recommend in the Barodynamic DT770 Pro 80 ohm studio headphones. Now remember, I'm just talking about comfort here, not sound quality. I'm actually not a huge fan of the way that they sound, but again, you're not looking for accuracy here. You're looking more so for comfort. But honestly, as far as accuracy goes, they're not too bad. But honestly, if you are looking for accuracy, just don't buy the Sony MDR7506 headphones. Those headphones have an insane boost in the high mids, causing them to be very inaccurate. A lot of my students end up thinking that they have have really bad sibilance when, in reality, it's just their headphones, the Sony MDR7506 headphones, making them think that they have sibilance because of the insane high boost in those headphones. I also recommend the Audio-Technica ATH line of headphones, specifically the 40s and the 50s, and I recommend those mainly for the price and comfort as well. Now, when it comes to things like open back, close back, what ohms are, and so on, I'll actually be making a video in the future all about this kind of information. Now, what about monitors? or 
speakers. Well, again, just like with headphones, voice actors don't need to go all out here wanting the most accurate sounding monitors or speakers. The main reason a voice actor would need monitors or speakers is just to give their ears a break from the headphones. Having audio blasted directly into your ears begins to hurt after a while, and you'll likely want to be able to take them off and give your ears a break. Honestly, I just recommend the Presonus Aris E3.5 Studio Pair. They only cost around 100 bucks, and they are more than enough for voice actors' needs. Even Joe Cipriano has them in his studio. Just like with headphones, though, I will be making a future video all about studio monitors and what to look for when it comes to things like accuracy and mixing audio on them. Totally different application than what voice actors actually need. All right, and now a portable monitor or tablet. This is just for you to be able to read your script from without having to print a ton of of paper. I recommend one of the portable monitors from Asus. Am I saying that right? I personally have one of them, and I'll leave a link in the description of this video as well as everything else that we've talked about so far. But if you happen to own a tablet or something like that, those will do just fine. All right, and now the most important part of any voice actor's home studio, soundproofing and acoustic treatment. Okay, so in the beginning, most people think that the microphone is what makes the biggest difference on whether your audio will actually sound good or bad, but Actually, the microphone plays a smaller role in that than you'd think. 70 to 80% of having professional sounding audio is how you acoustically treat the space that you're recording in. In my class, when we get to the home studio section and I begin helping my students treat and build out their home studios, I always start by saying this. Acoustics for audio is like lighting for photography. You can have a $10,000 camera, but if you have bad lighting, you will have a bad photo. You can have a $3,000 microphone, but if you have bad acoustics, you will have bad audio. Now, of course, having a super high-end camera will give you much more flexibility when it comes to exposure, but when it comes to audio, it's actually way more crucial. What I mean is, if I were to have an untreated space and in front of me I had a Rode NT1 and a Neumann U87, the $3,000 microphone would actually sound much worse than the $270 microphone, which likely sounds utterly backwards, I know. But here's the thing, that $3,000 microphone is a lot more sensitive than the $270 microphone, so it will actually amplify all of the problems in that space more than the other microphone would. Would, which in turn will actually make your audio sound much worse. Treating your space should come first before anything. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't go and buy a microphone before building out your home studio? Absolutely not. Go ahead and buy the mic and begin practicing. That's totally fine. You just want to make sure that your home studio is properly acoustically treated before you begin submitting for agents or recording auditions, things like that. All right, now this is how my audio sounds like in an untreated space. You can hear how I sound like I'm in a tube, a tin can, a box, something like that. My voice is bouncing off all of the hard surfaces around me and reflecting back into the microphone. Not a professional sound. So instead of your audio sounding like this, you're looking for your audio to sound more like this. I've got multiple acoustic treatment methods in this space to make the audio sound as dead as it does. My voice isn't bouncing off of hard surfaces and reflecting back into the microphone, which would cause the boxy sound like it did in the other space. All right, so now let's jump back to the untreated space so I can show you something that you're looking to achieve when treating your space. All right, so while I'm in this untreated space, I'm gonna clap a few times, then jump back and forth between the spaces to show you the difference in the liveliness of the space, if you will. All right, you hear how the claps almost immediately die in the treated space? That's what you're looking for. Now, there's actually a lot that goes into treating your space so that you can achieve those results, but everyone's space is totally different, which means it will require its own method of treatment. There's no one-size-fits-all solution here, unfortunately, which is what makes this step so challenging and elusive for most people. I've personally treated a few hundred home studios now, so I've got a really good handle on what it takes in most cases. Now, I'll give you a key tip here in just a second, but if you want want my help with your home studio, you can find all of the links to sign up with me in the description of this video. One thing a lot of people don't realize is that in my DAW classes, like Learn Adobe Audition, Learn Audacity, and Learn Twisted Wave, I actually cover home studio setup and treatment in great detail, as well as personally helping each one of my students build out and treat their home studios throughout each week in class. All right, so now to the tip. All right, so a huge tip for you to know right up front is that foam doesn't really work. So you saw when we were in my voiceover space that I had foam on the walls behind me, but here Here's the thing.
thing. Not only do I have foam covering every bit of bare wall in my space, I also have a ton of clothes, cushions, pillows, and blankets scattered throughout that are the reason that that foam actually works. That and the fact that the foam is four inches thick. Foam by itself does practically nothing. It's, it's like practically putting nothing on the walls. Now, not too long ago, I took out all of the clothes, cushions, pillows, and blankets out of my space. I just wanted to be able to organize them a little better because it, it's, it's quite a mess in there. But here's the thing. Once I got all of those clothes, cushions, pillows, and blankets and everything out of my space and it was just the four inch thick foam, my space immediately began to sound like I was in a big box or something like this. This is what it sounded like. And it's because four inch thick foam, just even though it's four inches thick, foam is just not enough by itself. It's not dense or thick enough to do what we need it to when we're treating a space. I bring up the foam because there are so many videos on YouTube talking about how amazing foam is and it's it's just not. I wish there was a better way to say all of this without it coming off as pretentious. But here's the thing. I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back. I'm just saying it so that you have a better understanding when it comes to this stuff. And with a better understanding comes more success in your career. I've had a few voice actors now tell me, well, I have foam in my space and it sounds great. Or I used to go to a studio and record all the time and the only thing they had is foam as treatment and it sounded good. Here's the thing. Most voice actors have absolutely no ear training whatsoever. They can't even hear how bad the audio sounds because ear training takes years and years of dedication and practice to get good at. Audio engineers' number one priority is ear training and that's why you have foam audio professionals. We hear things other people completely tune out. Our brains are actually really good at completely tuning things out. It's kind of like before you became a voice actor, you never heard all of the little subtle drones, hums, or noises throughout your home until you began trying to record. And all of a sudden, you begin picking up on all of those really annoying sounds and you think to yourself, how did I not hear these before? As an audio engineer, we train our ears to pick up on all of the subtle things that add up over time that most people don't even realize are there. I mean, I've personally heard voice actors audio almost daily that sounds really bad and they don't fix it for a couple of reasons. One, they have no idea it sounds bad because they lack ear training. Two, they consider themselves veterans because they've been doing it for so many years, so why should they need to update or fix their space? Basically, ego gets in the way. And they don't realize they could be booking so many more jobs a year if they would just make the changes and evolve with this ever-evolving industry. Or three, they have become used to the way that their space sounds, and even though it sounds really, really bad, their brains are used to that sound, and that to them becomes the correct sound. Acoustics and sound quality can be complicated, which is why we have professionals in this field to help out just like we have voiceover coaches to teach voiceover. A lot of voice actors get in a slump where they're not booking as much as they used to and they always think to themselves, hmm, maybe I need more training. And they almost never think, hmm, maybe I need to treat my home studio better so that I can compete with all of the other actors that are taking their audio and home studio quality seriously. Audio quality is 50% of what we do here. These days, you can have the most perfect delivery ever. But if your home studio and audio isn't competitive, you'll just get left behind. Don't let that be you. I really hope you found this helpful. And if you do have any questions, well, you know what they say.